Imagine you are playing a game. You say a date, and I tell you which day of the week it was, or will be. Not impressed? What if it only takes me two seconds to answer, regardless of which date you say? Well, not me personally, because I'm bad at these things, but anyone can, with a bit of practice, learn how to find the weekday of any given date in mere seconds. I'm Bernhard Werner, and this is a tutorial for John Conway's Doomsday Algorithm. Finding the weekday of a given date is in and of itself not a difficult task. You pick any date as a starting point, say the 1st of January 1970, which was a Thursday, and then you count to the day you are interested in. Take for example the day this video was released. It's the 3rd of October 2022, which is 19,268 days after the 1st of January 1970. That's 2,752 full weeks plus 4 days. So it's a Monday. A modern computer might need one millisecond to do this. What we want, as alluded to in the opening, is a way to do this in our head reasonably quickly. And John Conway found such a way in 1973. Note that this algorithm I show you now specifically works with the Gregorian calendar. For any other calendar system, there might exist similar procedures. The main idea is the following. If you look at a list of all 365 days of a year, we're ignoring leap years for a moment, then certain days will always share the same weekday. Take the 3rd of October again. It will always be the same weekday as the 10th of October, because that's exactly 7 days later. Similarly, the 17th of October falls on that weekday too, or the 24th, and so on. Of course, we can also move further up in the year, all the way to the 3rd of January, these dates will always be the same weekday. Now, which weekday that is in any given year is different, but it's always the same. And the same is true if we shifted this cluster. So the orange cluster starting with the 4th of January will always be one weekday later than the yellow cluster. In this way we could subdivide the days of a year into seven clusters, and each cluster would have the same weekday per year. But let's focus on the yellow cluster we started with. If we knew for a given year that this is, for example, a Monday, we could easily find the weekday of any other date. Is it three days after a yellow day? Then it's a Thursday. Is it two days before a yellow day? Saturday. In order for this to be useful, we need two things. First, we require a way to actually find the weekday of the yellow cluster. We will come to that in a minute. Second, we have to know the dates in the yellow cluster to use them as a jumping off point for the dates nearby. And here we are very lucky. There are a few dates in the yellow cluster that are quite effortless to remember. We assume that the month of a year are numbered the usual way, January is 1, February is 2, etc. Then most even numbered months have it super simple. The dates 4, 4, 6, 6, 8, 8, 10, 10 and 12, 12 are all in the yellow cluster i.e. the 4th of April through the 12th of December. For odd-numbered months, we have a slightly less simple pattern. 9-5 and 5-9, and 11-7 and 7-11. So the 9th of May, the 5th of September, the 11th of July and the 7th of November. John Conway suggested the mnemonic I work from 9 to 5 at the 7-11 to remember that. Here, 7-11 is the name of an American convenience store. Note how both these patterns circumvent any problem with date formatting. They work whether you write dates as day month or month day. Further up in the year, it gets a bit weird due to the occasional leap year. In February, the arguably easiest one of the yellow dates is the last day, so either the 28th or the 29th. For March, that means we can use the zeroth day of March. It's the same day as the last day of February. And it's a bit strange to call it the zeroth day of March, but it means that the nth day of March will be exactly n days after a yellow day. And that makes it quite straightforward to work with. Last and actually least, if I'm honest, is January. There, the quote unquote simple yellow day is the third in normal years and the fourth in leap years. You can also use the 31st in normal years and the 32nd in leap years which is actually the first day of February, but I always found it easier to work forward, starting at 3 or 4, than backwards from 31 and 32. 
these 12 special dates are what John Conway called the doomsdays. Apart from a few hiccups, they follow some nice patterns. Since they are all in the yellow cluster, they always share the same weekday. However, there are many dates missing in the yellow cluster. But these doomsdays are enough to work with, since they give us one day in every month. From there we can find any other date in weekday. However, depending on what you ascribe meaning to, there are a couple other neat dates in the yellow cluster. For example, the 14th of March, which is Pi Day, or the 26th of December, which is Boxing Day. And for November, I prefer to use the 0th day instead of the 7th, just like in March. If you went through the whole list of yellow dates, I'm sure you would find the birthday of loved ones or other dates that are meaningful to you personally. But with Conway's pattern, we get at least one day per month. Let's look at an example. If we knew that the yellow doomsday cluster is, say, a Wednesday in the year we are interested in, and we want to know what the 10th of December is, then we look for the nearest doomsday, which is the 12th of December. So our day is two days earlier and therefore must be a Monday. And if we want to find the weekday of the 15th of March, the nearest doomsday is the 0th of March. That's a difference of 15 days, which is two full weeks plus one day later. Therefore, it must be Thursday. With these doomsdays in mind, we still need to find a formula that computes their weekday for a given year. When we now start to do more calculations, it will be a bit easier to not say 15 is two full weeks plus one day, we will say 15 is 1 mod 7. So it's time for a short sidebar and talk about modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic describes what I call clock numbers. On a 12 hour clock, after hitting hour 12, you cycle back to hour 1. Quite literally, in fact, as the numbers on a clock are arranged in a circle. So, when you're at hour 11 and you advance 4 hours, you're ending up at hour 3, not at hour 15. Or rather, it is hour 15, but it's the same as hour 3. In math, we say that 3 is congruent to 15 modulo 12. Whenever we write a is congruent to b modulo n for integers a, b and n, we mean that a and b have the same remainder when divided by n. So, 3 is congruent to 15 modulo 12, since after dividing by 12, both have remainder 3. Hence, both are also congruent mod 12 to 27, 39, 51, and so on. But these numbers are also congruent to minus 9 mod 12. It might be a bit uncomfortable to think of minus 9 having a remainder of 3 when dividing by 12. Therefore, it's often easier to use a different characterization. A is congruent to B modulo n if that difference is divisible by n. In practice, you can always think of a clock. There, starting at 3, going back 12 hours would lead you to our minus 9, but it's the start point again. So minus 9 is 3 mod 12. And the days of the week also repeat cyclically. When it's Tuesday and you want to know which weekday it is 18 days later, you can look 4 days ahead instead and get Saturday because 18 is 4 mod 7. So far, we have used this little word mod together with the congruence sign to indicate a special form of equality. When we now venture into the direction of algorithms, we will encounter it in a slightly different role, as an operator. When we now write something like a mod n, we want this to be the unique number x between 0 and n minus 1 that is congruent to a modulo n. And that is precisely the remainder of a divided by n. So it's a function that takes a number a and gives back the remainder after dividing by n. For example, we want 45 mod 12 to output the result 9 because 45 is 3 times 12 plus a remainder of 9. In math, it is rather uncommon to use mod like this, but it is ubiquitous in computer science, so we'll use it. With modular arithmetic under our belt, we can start looking for the doomsdays. We start with numbering the weekdays in a way that makes it easy to do calculations with them. We start with Sunday, which gets a zero, and end on Saturday, which is a six. John Conway has a nice mnemonic for us to remember this. We can corrupt the names of the weekdays slightly to sound more like the associated numbers. Nunday, One Day, Tuesday, Triple Stay, 
fourth day, five day, sixth day. Now, to compute the weekday of a doomsday of a given year, we first split the number that represents the year in two. The last two digits, which forms a number we denote by y, let's call it the year number, and the rest in front, which we denote by c. This is the century number. Not a century, mind you, because, for example, the year 1937 is in the 20th century, but the number that sits at the hundreds position. With the century number, we can compute the so-called anchor day, which is the basis for the next steps. It is the weekday of the doomsday in the year C100, i.e. 1800, 1900, 2000, etc. This anchor day, let's call it A, can be computed with the formula C mod 4 times 5 plus 2 mod 7. The mod 7 at the end is due to the fact that we are dealing with weekdays. We could do without this, though. A key feature of modular arithmetic is that you can do all calculations with integers as you're used to and do the modulus step at the very end. But since we want to do these calculations in our head, it's better to apply this modulus step right away. The mod 4 step takes care of leap years, so it's finally time to deal with that weird calendar feature. The speed with which the Earth orbits the Sun and the speed with which it spins around its axis are, unfortunately, not in a nice relation to each other. So, a year consists of approximately 365.2422 days on average. That means if you want for certain dates to be always in the same position throughout the turn of the seasons, we have to compensate for the discrepancy. Since 0 0.2422 is about one fourth, the general idea is to add a day every four years, which we know as the 29th of February. To get closer to the offset of 0 0.2422, the actual leap year rule is a little bit more complicated. A year is a leap year, and therefore gets a leap day, if it is divisible by 4, unless it is divisible by 100, then it's not a leap year, unless it's divisible by 400, then it's a leap year yet again. Going back to the formula for the anchor day, we see that the C mod 4 takes care of the 400 year long leap year cycle. The next important fact to realize is that the weekday of a given date moves forward by 1 each year. That's because 365 is 52 times 7 plus 1 and therefore congruent to 1 mod 7. For example, the 3rd of October 2022 is a Monday and the 3rd of October 2023 is a Tuesday. And if there is a leap day in between, we move forward by two weekdays that year. So, over the course of 100 years, we move forward 100 weekdays, but we also have 24 leap years, so it's a total of 124 weekdays. Since 124 is 17 times 7 plus 5, which is congruent to 5 mod 7, we can just move 5 weekdays forward for every 100 years to get the same result. And that's what the C mod 4 times 5 computes. Finally, the plus 2 shifts everything to the correct starting place. Now, this formula is easy enough to remember and to evaluate for a given century number C. But due to the mod 4 at the very start of the calculation, there will only ever be 4 numbers that can be the result. And it's much easier to just remember them by heart for a stretch of 4 centuries. This is commonly done for the century numbers 18, 19, 20 and 21. When doing this doomsday algorithm, it will often be with birthdays that people will tell you or other dates that are important to them. And those fall typically into these four centuries. So, we compute 18 mod 4 times 5 plus 2 mod 7 equals 5. And similarly for the others. 19 gives 3, 20 gives 2 and 21 gives 0. Then, we forget the calculation and just learn these four anchor days by heart. This pattern repeats cyclically when we move further into the past or future. So if we need the anchor day of any other century number, we shift it up or down by 4 until it reaches these values. For example, for a date in the 1200s, the anchor day would be 2, since 12 is congruent to 20 mod 4. And recall that we ignore any other calendar system used in the past, present or future for this. To get from the anchor day A to the actual weekday of the doomsday in a year, we have to shift it by a certain amount s, based on the year number y. Remember that this was the last two digits of the year. To find s, we use the same argument as before. 
every year we move forward, the weekday of a date gets shifted forward by one. So after Y years, we shift it by Y weekdays. Moreover, in the span of Y years, there are about Y divided by four leap years, which shift the weekday forward one additional day. So the total additional shift after Y years is Y plus Y divided by four rounded down, mod seven. That's what those weird brackets mean, rounding down to the nearest integer. And this is where we could stop. Maybe look at a few examples for the whole algorithm, but remember that we want to do all of that in our head in just a few seconds. And for large values of y, these shift calculations are a bit tedious. Take for example the year number y equal 97. First, we have to divide it by 4, which is relatively hard. The result is 24.25, so 24 after rounding down. Then we have to add it back to 97. That's okay, but also a bit tricky. We get 121. Lastly, we have to reduce it mod 7, which means dividing it by 7 to start. And that's really hard now. 7 fits 17 times into 121, and the remainder is 2. So the shift S is 2. With a bit of practice, it becomes manageable, I guess. But here I want to show you a formula that is in and of itself more complicated, but much easier to do mentally. And it's not the one Conway came up with. He did something that involves dividing by 12, which is arguably already easier than this. However, I don't like it that much. Instead, I will show you a formula found by Chamberlain Fong and Michael Walters in 2010. We still want to know what y plus y divided by 4 rounded down is. But instead of computing it directly, we perform the following steps. Is y odd? If yes, define a new number y prime as y plus 11 and then divide it by 2. If no, define y prime as y directly divided by 2. Next, is y prime odd? If yes, define a new number y2 prime as y prime plus 11. If no, define y2 prime as the same as y prime. Then the shift s we are looking for is minus y2 prime mod 7. This is called the odd plus 11 rule for pretty obvious reasons. As an example, let's look at the year number y equal 97 from before. First, it is odd. So we get y prime as 97 plus 11 divided by 2. So 108 divided by 2, which is 54. This is even, so we keep it. Mod 7 is the same as minus 2, as 56 is divisible by 7. So the shift s we want is minus minus 2, which is 2. If you do this a couple of times, you will realize that it's much easier than the direct formula, because you only have to divide by 2 instead of 4. Moreover, you don't add the result of the division back to the original year number, which makes the numbers smaller and the following mod 7 step easier. So, while it might have more individual steps, this odd plus 11 rule is, on average, easier to do in your head. I won't prove here that this rule gives the same result as y plus y over 4, but you can find an archive link to Fongs and Walter's paper in the doobly-doo. Instead, I will wrap up this video with a couple of examples for the whole process. Let's start with the 21st of August, 1937. We split 1937 in two. The century number C is 19 and the year number Y is 37. The anchor day for C equal 19 is A equal 3. Recall that we remember this by heart, but we have a formula if necessary. Next, the shift S based on the year number Y. Y is odd, so we compute Y prime as 37 plus 11 divided by 2, which is 24. This is even, so we keep it as Y2 prime. Mod 7 it is 3, so the shift is minus 3. Together, anchor day A plus shift S is 3 minus 3 equals 0. That means in the year 1937, all those special dates called doomsdays and the yellow cluster we started this video with are weekday zero, which means Sunday. What's left is to find one of those doomsdays nearby. It's 8-8, so our date is 13 days later. That is minus one mod seven, so it's one weekday before the doomsday, Saturday. Next, let us consider the 23rd of March, 1882. The century number C is 18, which means an anchor day of A equal 5. The year number Y is 82, 
it's even, so we get y prime as 82 divided by 2 equal 41. That's odd, so we add 11 to get y2 prime as 52. Mod 7 it is 3, so the shift s is minus 3. Together we get a plus s equal 2 as the weekday of the doomsdays in 1882. The 23rd of March is 23 days after the doomsday series of March, so it's weekday number 25, mod 7 that's 4, a Thursday. Last example, the 24th of January 2152. The century number C is 21, which means an anchor day of A equals 0. The year number Y equal 52 is even, so Y prime is 26. It's even again, so Y2 prime is 26, 2. Mod 7 is 5, so the shift is minus 5. We get a doomsday weekday of 0 minus 5 equal minus 5. Since the year number 52 is divisible by 4 and not by 100, it is a leap year. Note that we don't need to check this separately though. If both y and y prime are even during the odd plus 11 process, we automatically know that y is divisible by 2 twice, which is the same as being divisible by 4. Since we're in January in a leap year, the closest doomsday is the 4th. To the 24th we are interested in, it's a difference of 20. 20 days after minus 5 is 15, or mod 7, 1, a Monday. If you enjoyed this topic and want to read more, the Wikipedia article is a great point to start from, but I would recommend Shirban Roberts' excellent biography on John Conway called Genius at Play. There you can read what he himself has to say about all this. If you want to practice this algorithm, I would be very happy if you gave my little app a try. You can get it for free on the Google Play Store. It's quite basic, but it shows you a few neat statistics, like your longest run without a mistake. Links to everything down below. Lastly, if you're still here, if I did everything correctly, the thumbnail of this video should always show the current date and weekday in the middle. Please leave a comment whether it actually does for you. It has nothing to do with Conway's algorithm, but it was a nice coding challenge. And I'd like to hear whether it works properly. With that, Thanks for watching and until next time.